Welcome to Beverly End. My name is Mark Machado. I'm joined by my cousin across the pond, Dominic Machado, and joining us uh, from a tropical island paradise, not Sri Lanka, off Jamaica, it's Nick Brooks, one of the doyens of Sri Lankan cricket. Uh, we got a lot to talk about this week. Uh, the women's are the women's team are in the process of trying to qualify for the World Cup later this year in Bangladesh. Um, other play, other Sri Lankan players are having varying degrees of success at the IPL. And I think we need to start looking and discussing our potential World Cup squad because that is looming on the horizon. It's it's coming up much quicker than you can realise. Before I do that, though, I've got to remind you, we do have a newsletter. It does come out every week. I, can put the, I have put the link in the description, so sign up for it there if you haven't done so already. Tell all your friends and family we're here. Sri Lankan Cricket's on the up and up at the moment, and uh, we all want to have as many conversations about it and learn and talk about it as much as possible because that's what being a fan is all about. Um the women had quite a comprehensive win in their in their first qualifier today against Thailand. Um, they they scored 122 for five, which I thought maybe was a little thin, but then they managed to bowl them all out for 55. Um, Dom, we were saying before we recorded that it was a bit of a blink and you miss it innings for for, mm. the, for the Thai team because the Shranka really did tidy like tidy that up that wicket very quickly. Uh, what were your kind of main takeaways from it? Yeah, I was disappointed a bit with the batting. I thought um, against Thailand, uh, they could put up a big, big score and kind of impress their dominance upon their opponents, but they seemed to struggle. I couldn't quite tell if that was the speed of the wickets, and I think it may have been, judging from how the Sri Lankan bowlers did eventually bowl, but I thought they'd maybe go a bit more aggressive, so they were... They had kind of shelved their big shots and were ready to kind of consolidate and take the game long. And maybe that's a um, a strategy that they want to employ in the qualifiers, just make sure they get through, uh, because it is a fairly long process. They've got five, uh, sorry, four games in their group. And then if they're in the top two of their group, they go on to a semifinal, and then if they win that semifinal, they qualify, and then they play the final. So they've got kind of a long road ahead and maybe are trying to avoid speed bumps. Uh, Positives, um, Nilakshi had another good finishing hand. Uh, She scored 29 from 20, backing up her performance supporting uh, Chamri in, uh, in South Africa. So that was good. It was good to see some firepower. We saw that in some of the warm-ups from Kavisha Dilhari. So seeing additional firepower down the order in addition to Chamri is going to be a huge, huge plus. Um, of course, Harsitha, uh, Harsitha was not there, and she's probably their second best batter at the moment. So that also may have impacted them. Bowling-wise, I thought they bowled really, really well. Inoshi was very good. She was tossing the ball up, getting a lot of turns. She took three wickets, was player of the match. Um, and again, Udeshika Prabodhani provided a breakthrough in that first over. Her left arm angle proved really useful. And the women bowled and fielded really well. It was a professional performance. It was one of those things that from years of watching Sri Lankan's men's cricket, I thought, oh gosh, they've had a subpar score here. Now they're going to go and... Um, let Thailand chase it down, but they made sure that there was no there was no real threat to their total. And that was very, very impressive. And it's good to see the bowling step up and really impose themselves upon the opposition. Nick, is this a win-win or a loss-loss for Shranka even being involved in the qualifiers? Because we're, we're definitely the most established cricket cricketing nation over there. But we saw... Um, Earlier today, Zimbabwe lost to Vanuatu, a team that had to kind of crowdsource their mm. or crowdfund even their their whole experience to get to the qualifiers. Does does that mean that actually, I mean, a Sri Lanka shouldn't you know they should be kind of disappointed that they're there in the first place, and b that the only potential thing that can happen, like they're very like like they they almost definitely will qualify, but the the only thing that could possibly happen to kind of upset the apple cart is they actually lose and that can kind of not be particularly great for the whole team. Yeah, I think it's uh, an unusual situation for Sri Lanka and actually 
one that comes with quite a lot of pressure because they're used to being the underdogs, really, aren't they? Mm. You know, we've seen that in recent series against South Africa, against England, um, against New Zealand. They've had good results as a team who probably weren't expected to produce that much. But here the f- script's really flipped, isn't it? Mm. I think that we're all kind of expecting them to win every game. And Dom touched on it just now. You know, they put up 120 and you're suddenly thinking, oh, like that wasn't at all what we were expecting. So there's a little bit of pressure on them, but I think it's just a great opportunity to play lots of cricket, to, you know, figure things out, to hopefully win lots of games ahead of the tournament later in the year. And I think that ultimately uh, the spinners are going to be a lot for most of these teams to deal with, as we saw with Thailand today. And I mean, yeah, the expectations on Sri Lanka, but I think that in a way is a good thing. And I think they should cruise Mm. through this tournament. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm feeling really excited about the women's team and where they're at at the moment. As Dom said, we're seeing sort of um, strength and depth really developing and I think they're in a good place and it's just great to see them playing such regular cricket. Uh, Dom, you're, you're fast becoming our kind of stats guy on, yeah. the, on this show. <laughs> you uh, dug up a stat about Charmory mm. and Aravinda, right? Was that right? Or Oh, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Stat? Yeah, so I think the, the stat that I had, one thing that's interesting to show how the T20 side is developing. The last time that... Sri Lanka had a woman be player of the match in ODIs that was not Chamri was 2015. Um, in T20s, we've actually had it in two out of the last three matches we've played. Um, so I believe Kavisha won it, or was it Vishmi? I forget whether it was Kavisha or, or Vishmi that won it in the first T20 against South Africa. And then in this game, um, Inoshi won it. And so we're seeing a little bit of diversity in who is putting their hands up and who is winning in the T20 format. So in as much as we've been kind of hailing their ODI success, they're a bit more uh, dependent on Chamri in the longer format. But in the shorter format, it seems like uh, the other women are putting their hands up. One thing I want to add to, to your question, Mark, about should we feel bad that they're even at this stage? So the qualification date was... February 27th, 2023. And our team didn't start playing um, international cricket after the three-year hiatus until June 2022. So the results didn't really even have time to filter in and and change anything. So I think they're putting themselves in good shape for automatic qualification in the future. But um, unfortunately, they've had to miss out because of that layoff they had from international cricket uh, in 21 and 22. I am super excited for where this team goes. Um, I'm hoping that kind of like we've seen with the men's side, I, I say that like we've seen, is that not, what's happened in the few of the most recent ICC tournaments is the men's team have, have gone to qualifiers, cruised through them, built up a lot of momentum, and we've all gone in with high expectations. I kind of like the fact that I think we're the only we're three of the only four people on on the whole of YouTube. The fourth person being Estelle, who's not with us today, who are kind of talking up the the Sri Lanka women's side as a kind of dark horse for uh for, for the the World Cup. But actually, the more I think about it, especially we spent a whole hour last week extolling the virtues of Charmory, The more I'm like, yeah, I, I I think I think you can put them top four now. Like anything below a semi final at that World Cup <laughs> would seem disappointing. And you know, Charmory herself is kind of saying that. Hopefully, yeah. what we get out of this 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 qualifies is as you know, as you say, Dom, is some of the younger players get that experience they need, find their feet really start to fry their feet in international cricket um, and, you know, can put put some good performances in. What do you say, Nick? Yeah, I think um, there's good reason for our optimism. I mean, and some of the messaging coming from Chalmery looks like that tournament could be her swan song. And so I think there might be a little extra motivation Mm. in the camp to send her off in style. And I mean, look, we've seen it time and again over the last year or so, haven't we, that this women's team is capable of bloodying the noses of teams who are ranked much higher than them. And, you know, to go and beat England 
in T20s right off the back of the 100 mm. uh, was hugely impressive. What they've just done in South Africa was massively impressive. So I don't see any reason for pessimism. And I think when it comes to the main tournament, they'll see it as a bit of a free hit, right? Mm. Pressure's mm. off, go out there, have a swing. And yeah, I think they can tie some teams up and do really well. Oh, go ahead, Dom. No, I was going to say they'll also have the Asia Cup before that to kind of warm up and play against some of the sides against uh, Pakistan, India and, and Bangladesh and test themselves because they've been playing a lot of uh, cricket in, in Sina countries. So it'll be important for them to play um, in Asia because the World Cup's in Bangladesh. Yeah, and, and actually all our spin options, they're going to come to the full, hopefully, in Bangladesh, right? So, And speaking uh, of spin options, we should mention one of the exciting pieces of news is that uh, Sashini uh, Gimhana is going to, according to Chamri, maybe get a couple of games in the qualifiers. So she's a 15-year-old left arm wrist spinner. So I don't think we've ever had a left arm wrist spinner play for us in women's cricket. So the fact that she's 15 and a left arm wrist spinner will be really exciting. I don't, to be to be honest, I don't know how many left arm wrist spinners are going around at the moment in women's cricket. So that could not be a, a lot, kind right? of, no, not that any of that I could think of. So that might be kind of a mystery element that uh, we bring into the tournament that might keep uh, other teams up at night. I'm very excited about her, her pending debut. And actually, I mean, we, we talked about this quite a bit on this show. There is a bit of talent coming through from from the the kind of the youth setup. Mm -hmm. And on top of all that, you know, we're, one of the bigger kind of wider topics within the trunk and cricket is where the players come from. And actually SLC seem to be, they seem to be sides or at least intent that they would, they, with the women's game in particular, they would have kind of spread it out a little bit and try and find players from regions mm -hmm. that don't traditionally produce players. Um, so, you know, hopefully that this batch of girls is, can inspire the next batch of girls. And, you know, we, we want to, you know, I, th I think I can speak for all of us when I say we want, you know, sustainable and sustained uh, success for Sri Lankan cricket in, in all, you know, across all genders and across all formats. And the only way to do that isn't to rely on, you know, the, the occasional charmery popping up who's a kind of athletic freak, mm. but actually to develop structures where, you know, kids from all over the island can can fulfill their potential. And, uh, you know, there is some stuff that is suggesting that SLC are doing a, a better job than they used to. I won't say they did a good job because people will come at me in the comments. And you can leave <laughs> us comments because we, we do all read them all the time. Um should we move on? Um, if we had a sponsor, this is where we play the we'd we'd put the advert, but we don't have a sponsor. If you want to sponsor us, you can get in touch. Um, and should we talk about the the contrast and fortunes of some of the Sri Lankan players at the IPL? Let's start at the boys who are doing the best, and then we kind of talk about the rest underneath. Um, I think all three of us absolutely lose our minds every time CSK play. And uh, Paterana has has the ball in his hand. He's he's one of the most exciting players in the world right now, um, and he's in the biggest league in the world, where he gets paid a lot of money for it. And so far, Nick, he seems to be earning every penny of it, right? Yeah, absolutely, man. And I actually feel like the cat's kind of out of the bag now, and the whole world is waking up to the fact that Paterana, I would say, is pretty much Bumrah aside, as good a death bowler going as there is anywhere. Uh, that game against Lucknow the other night, the 17th over that he bowled was just magic, mm. right? He picked up a huge wicket of Nicky Poran. And then I think he went for six in the 17th and looked like he'd totally changed the yeah. game. Obviously, Stoinis went crazy and got them over the line. But I mean, he looked leaps and bounds better than Fizz, who's one of the better death bowlers going around. And he just seems to be developing really fast. It feels like there have been far less wides and it's not all about 150 mile an hour Yorkers, right? He's mm -hmm. doing all kinds of things. There are lots of slower balls at the death. He's mixing his lengths up really well. And I mean, they were, look, the highlight from that game is that they lost, but I think they were centimetres, not inches away from winning it, right? There was a mm. Stoinis four in the 17th over that just went past backward point then there was that uh 
outside edge in the 18th over, which nutmegged Deepak Chahar on yeah. the boundary and was like a, the sort of fielding that I do, uh, which is rarely seen in the professional game. So, I mean, he's, I think he's now getting to the stage really that we talked about a few weeks ago where he's kind of changing games single-handedly. And um, I think also teams are now probably eyeing him up as a kind of asterisk bowler who you consider as someone who can change the game with a couple of overs, especially in the second half of innings, yeah. right? Yeah. I think that's absolutely spot on. When a couple of things I wanted to throw on in addition to that is we were all talking about the 2014 World Cup on our WhatsApp chat and go read Nick's article, which is a brilliant summation of what went down. But we all talked about how brilliant the death bowling was. And I see Patirana bringing in that wide Yorker more and more and really being accurate with it. Um, he's so hard to get up in the air. It seems like half of the boundaries that teams get against him are inside edges that um, basically go very, very fine and no one can get to them and cut off. The second thing is that there was heavy, heavy do in that game at um, against the Super Giants. So those two overs he bowled were excellent given the conditions. He was basically bowling with a soapy wet ball with a slinging action and still performing really, really well. The fact that he is the bank for you know the defending champions of the IPL is truly outstanding. He's still 21 years old. He's a superstar. Uh, he is the one who's grabbing the headlines aside from MS Dhoni in that side. And I think uh, he's having a massive impact on the league. Um, I don't know if you all saw the news, but Garuka Sunketh got signed as a net bowler for, um, who was it? Was it for Delhi? It was for Delhi. DC, yeah. DC, yeah. And so getting used to that arm angle is something that teams are all looking for. And so that's going to provide opportunities and uh, create opportunities for more Lunkin bowlers with that action. I want to give a shout out to Mark here, who said that we're going to see a whole battery of slingers coming into pro into professional and international cricket years ago. And guess what? It's happening now. The revolution is here. Do, do you know what? Like, just on that, I, I'm surprised about how long it's taken. I mean, like, I do think you can kind of put Boomerah is the kind of second one after Malinga, right? And that actually, in a way, like, Boomerah's kind of moved it on a little bit since, since what, what Malinga did. And in a way, he's kind of more, I think, possibly more kind of instrumental in, in, in making more kind of slingy actions because he's the kind of middle ground between Malinga and and a kind of more orthodox action, right? Um, and I think it's kind of more easier to replicate. It's, it is also really surprising to me that, I mean, Sri Lanka now have, have two international cricketers who have replicated post Malinga who who pretty fairly replicate his action, yeah. right? Um who who who've now kind of played top left level, got wickets at, at every level they've played at. And that note that hasn't happened anywhere else. Uh, there's, uh, there's Zaman, one dude in yeah. the PSL, isn't there? But, Zaman Khan. Uh, yeah. He made it he actually yeah. made his international debut against us, I think, in the Asia Cup. Uh, oh really? Oh, yeah. I must have forgotten about that. I must have yeah. blanked it. Um, no, but, but it is basically a purely Sri Lankan yeah. phenomenon, isn't it? Um, and I mean, I, you can talk, yeah, yeah, like Bumra and Naveen as the kind of like halfway straight arm slingers. But I'm, I think the next phase of this in the next like five, 10 years is that we're going to start seeing uh, sling bowlers around the world because it is, I mean, it's hugely effective, right? Yeah. We've seen it um, that Malinga and Paterana now are in a short list of guys who are, hugely effective at the death and i mean yeah it's just like it seems undeniable that this yeah. is a t20 skill which um holds up right yeah yeah i, I mean i i can't, i think it was in the mumbai indians game when tushara made his debut where the the commentators were talking about uh i, th I think it was kp on the comms was talking about c how how these actions get coached right and we know i mean there's no point on on a shrugging cricket podcast talking about how unorthodox bowlers end up being made we should maybe do a, a yeah put that on a sub stack or something right but um the idea that now like when you coach the bat i you know i i was taught how to play cricket 
admittedly, I, I can't really play cricket, but I was given conventional coaching in the kind of, I suppose, early 90s and mid 90s, mid 90s more so, uh, mid to late 90s. And the, just the way I was taught to play cricket, which is kind of out of the ECB book, is just not how you would you would teach people to play cricket now. Mm. I see someone like Joss Butler, who probably, you know, he's, isn't that much younger um, younger than me, who probably, you know, five or six years younger than me, I think he is. And he bats in such a totally different way. I remember getting screamed at by coaches for trying to play the ball across the line, move, you know, things like moving your head, that kind of baseball style mental, mentality of... of uh, of t20 batting and that's essentially what has happened with with our bowling options mm. right and that's kind of infected the whole island um and i just don't understand why more countries in the world don't go right we can't just have the orthodox way of bowling we can't change your you know if you come in with, with a strange action we need to work to develop it not to kind of rebuild it like yeah well i think th there's so many horror stories i think there's that. two parts to that so one is, you know, we had Murley and Ajanta Mendes, and it seemed pretty hard to replicate them. So I wonder if there was some thinking that these guys are just one-off freaks and their bowling action is non-replicable in a legal fashion, right? Which was kind of the case with Murley. Um, there was Thurindu Kaushal, who was called the duplicate Murley, who ended up having his career ruined by trying to bowl a deucer and then getting called for checking. I think people thought, no, this has got to be some kind of thing that is not really repl replicable, not really coachable. And I think there's a lot of mystery around it, even though there necessarily shouldn't be. Like, is it more or is it more injury producing than other types of fast bowling? I don't think we've seen any evidence to suggest that fast bowlers just happen to get injured all the time. So I think that's one key point is that Sri Lanka's past history has led people to think, okay, this guy's a one-off freak. It's not reproducible. When in fact, this bowling action actually is. And and the other thing about Paterano is, is he bowls much quicker than than Malinga ever did, right? Like he he's if he bowled in orthodox fashion, he'd be an out and out of pace uh, fast bowler, right? Mm. And that, like he could. I mean, it's a bit of a weird way to think about it, but if it, you know, if it was coming from a, a, a more vertical release point, then you wouldn't worry about him bowling at the highest level, right? If you can get a ball down that track legally yeah. at that kind of pace, it would be fine, right? And I suppose it kind of shows how the action has kind of developed to kind of it or could be developed into into different areas. Um, Nick, before you know, uh, Dom mentioned Murley there as as the kind of first Sri Lankan freak bowler. Was there any kind of freaks before him that you can Not think of? That I can think of. Uh, I, as far as I can recall, everyone was pretty orthodox. Uh, yeah, I think maybe uh, there were some slingy bowlers. I think maybe someone like Kehel Gamua was quite slingy. There were some rumors that. I mean, Pete, the, some of these guys back in the day were chucking. Um, but yeah, I think everyone had a sort of slight cloud of suspicion on them in the 60s and 70s. Uh, but yeah, to touch on your point, Marky, I can't remember Malinga at any stage of his career being like consistently in the 150s in terms of pace. And so for Paturana to be up there already, I mean, I know I talk about it the whole time, but he's still whip it thin right. Mm. And as he gets stronger, he should it theoretically get quicker. Um, so it's really, really exciting. I mean, I think that he is uh, more developed than Malinga was. At how old Paterana? 22 now, 23? 21. 21. 21, wow, yeah. I mean, so like, I think he's further along than Malinga was at this stage. And it just seems like the sky's the limit for him. It's hugely, hugely uh, exciting. Um, I can't wait to keep watching him for the next like five, ten years. And I mean, as you said, Marky, like now every time CSK play, for me, it's must watch TV. Yeah. And I'm just tuning in, waiting for the moment that the power plays over. He's going to get the ball in his hand and start wreaking havoc. Uh, we'll get to, to uh, Tushara, who's, I suppose, counterpart at Mumbai Indians in a few moments. But I think we need to have a moment to discuss Dinkshner because... He's not gotten into the. He's not had a run in the side. I don't think that's necessarily 
um, you know, his, his IPL over, as it were. I think we will see him. Um, but should we, I know I asked this last week or two weeks ago, should we be worried? Should we be worried that we haven't seen much of him? Uh, I think it's largely a balance thing, mm-hmm. right? That they're going to play, they feel like they need to play two overseas batsmen and um, Paterana and Fizz are yeah. kind of locked in. But um, I don't know, I have felt like since the ODI World Cup, it's been a slightly tougher time for Theeks. Uh, but he's bowled, he's bowled fine in some periods of the IPL. But I wonder whether it's that slight kind of like sophomore album effect where, um, mm-hmm. you know, he's a mystery spinner. And when he was unseen, batters were finding him very, very difficult to score runs off. And maybe uh, the increasing kind of familiar familiarity with his variations and what he bowls means that... Uh, batters are finding it slightly easier to score against him and he needs to keep on developing and keep mixing it up. But I don't think it's cause for um, too much concern. Yeah. I wonder whether next year in the IPL with the mega auction coming up, he might find a new home and that might be good for all parties. Yeah, I think... Go ahead, Mark. I was just going to say, I think the mega auction, it's, it's, it, I'm interested to see where the spinners go, who... Who picks which spinner? Because to me, that firstly, I think some of the teams and we'll get onto Mumbai Indian shortly. I keep teasing it, uh, but they're the ones that stick out to me. I just the the balance of the sides are totally, yeah. totally weird, um, and it, it seems to me like the the kind of spin options for some of the teams are just it was ill thought through, um, and I don't know if it's a case of the the auction. Because I obviously all the other sports I follow, I say all the other sports. Basically, I mean the Premier League and and European football don't have auctions; they don't exist. So you kind of build balance over the you know over the course of a number of transfer windows. Uh, Nick's nodding along; he knows this more than anyone because he's a Chelsea fan. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, I and it kind of and I look at at the IPL through that prism, but that's a totally. It's not quite the right way to look at it. But what I do think is, is that the, the mega auction, because they know it happens, what, every four or five years, mm. that it kind of, teams kind of take, almost like take a punt on what is going to happen because it kind of, it puts everything back in the wash again. Yeah. It's, it's a, a lot, of, yeah. I, we're not, this is a shrunken cricket podcast. It's not an IPL podcast. But for the record, I would like to say I'm not a fan of mega auctions. Um should we move on now and and talk? Sorry, Dom, you were going to yeah, say something. Yeah, I was going to add one thing about uh, Deeks Chanel. So two things that all um, become clear. So first, I think Fizz is going home um, now. Like he's his NOC is through the end of April, so he should be going home relatively soon. So we'll see if Deeks gets action. We'll also see that depending on whether they want to persist with. Um, Fizz after kind of his his um, failure in the last match. I think the other thing that might be harming uh, Patirana is the fact that he's an sort of all phases bowler. So you can plug him in and use him wherever you need to put in a stopgap. I think if he has a clear role to play, like there was a time with Sri Lanka that he would always take the new ball and he'd be one of the two new ball guys and he'd try to get that swing with the first ball. Um, or, you know, he's saving his overs for the death. So you can, because he's hard to get away, um, you're fine with giving up singles at that point. So I think he's kind of been used in all different areas because he has a diverse skill set. So I think coming back to a team where his role is a bit is a bit more settled and where there's a set plan for how he should bowl, I think that may benefit him uh, quite well. Um. Should we move on and talk about Tushara? Because we're all excited about him mm-hmm. getting firstly getting picked up in the um in the auction last time. As much as I'm not a fan of them, it is fun when that happens. Um and he, we finally got to see him. He came on as a as this impact sub, as a bowler, um, which I, I, I thought was a bit of slander because I heard he can swing a bat quite well. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> like we, we, part of that aside, it wasn't the I thought his first over was really good. Mm. And then he had a bit of a disastrous second over. I thought part of that 
where's the fielding? There was a couple of boundaries that maybe a better field layout could have could have prevented. And then it kind of just petered away. And it, I, th- I think, you know, I think he's a big confidence guy and it didn't quite work for him. And also on top of that, everything else seems to be falling apart around him for the for the players and the squad. But I think he, I, I, I suspect he's probably done enough for them at some point, maybe not the next game they play, but to have another look at him. What do you think, Nick? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, look, obviously it wasn't, the ideal IPL debut. But, I mean, in the context of the game, everyone was getting smashed, weren't they? And there are very few bowlers who haven't taken a bit of tap during the course of this IPL. You know, teams are putting up huge scores. Uh, Yeah, I I don't think we can read too much into this. I don't think they used him ideally right. Mm. There There didn't seem to be a load of swing, but he got the second over and then was brought back, I think, for the last over of the power play. So, I mean, if you're going to use him, you might as well use him through those first three, four overs when the ball has a chance to move around. Um, And yeah, I mean, look, Kurtzier went for runs and I don't think anyone's saying that he's um, like all of a sudden um, Mm. a waste of space. Uh, So I think the people who are coming out online and saying that Tushara can't bowl uh, are overreacting somewhat. And I, yeah, I hope that we get to see him more and I'd really like to see him taking the first over. I think, did Hardik bowl the first over again? Yeah. Um, Hardik bowled the first over. Oh, Hardik I bowled mean, the first uh, over, bowled the second, and Tushara bowled the third, yeah. right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, I don't understand why Hardik is taking the new ball with the options that they've got. Uh, and, yeah, I think... I think only Tushara... Hardik knows he's taking why he's taking the new ball. And I'm sure, look, he's been a great servant of cricket, and I'm sure he... He he's he's got an idea in his mind of the strategy. Can you tell that I started saying something that I decided that I actually didn't want to say? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I hope that we get to see him again, yeah. and that we get him to see him take the new ball in swinging conditions, and um, yes, playing some stumps with some yeah. beautiful entailing dipping Yorkers. Yeah, hundred percent agreed. I feel like it's it's the mark you alluded to this. Mumbai's bowling lineup is really strange. They don't really have anyone who can bowl in the middle overs. And they've kind of taken to having Muhammad Nabi do that um, now. And it just seems like it's a poorly constructed team. Those first six overs, you're trying to use four or five bowlers between Hardik, Kutsia, Bumra, Tushara. And it just seems like it's a bit of a mess. And maybe, you know, sort of as the chances that MI make uh, the playoffs go down, Tashara will be allowed to do what he's been brought there to do, which is bull early overs and bull at the death. I, I'm i um, excited about the possibility. And I know we're not, we're still talking about the IPL, we're not talking about the World Cup, of Sri Lanka having eight overs off, off sling in a, in a game. Because I, I think that's a real challenge for even like the the more established teams. And if we could get Tushara, who played against Bangladesh, and CSK's Paterana slinging them down there, I think it's a real handful, especially, in, you know, we're going to be playing games in, in with dropping pitches. We have no idea how those pitches are going to play. So there's doubt in the, in the batsmen's minds anyway. I just think, why not give it a go? Mm-hmm. Yeah, the other thing is, I think the period, the Malinga period has passed, right? So there was a group, a small group of batters, Virat Kohli included, who had figured out how to kind of take apart Malinga by the end. I think that knowledge has not been passed down to the next generation. I think a lot of these guys are seeing it for the first time. So I, I kind of wholeheartedly agree there, Mark, that this is your chance to kind of use this as much as possible and take full advantage of it before the world adapts. Nick, do you like to see eight overs of sling from... uh... I'd I'd love to see eight overs of sling. We're going to get on to talking about the World Cup squad. I don't know how likely it is because I'm thinking that it looks like Sri Lanka are going to field two frontline seamers. And uh, I mean, I think we all agree that June third, Paterana is playing, come what may. And yeah. I think that will be outraged. We'll start a Murley End protest if he's not on the team sheet. Um, 
But I think, yeah, that I would love to see eight overs of sling. I think it's really exciting, really different, really dangerous. Um, and because also batters aren't used to facing fast bowlers who can get the ball to dip like that, mm. right? And so it is just something which is disconcerting. Uh, but I'm not sure how likely it is. We'll move on to talking about that. But before we move off the IPL, I did see a picture today of um, Dushi Chimera in KKR kit, which okay. I thought was exciting it wasn't a game situation but um i'd like kind of forgotten that he was in the ipl or thought that he might be injured or something so so to see him like a, there was a picture of him running up to bowl in the nets in a kkr mm. shirt which excited me somewhat yeah I, I i i wonder if as we kind of drift towards the back end of the group stages if if we oh. might see him get a game just because they might want to kind of mix things up a little bit and i mean the the only other I think the only other stronger player there, as far as I can remember, because it's difficult to remember with injuries and stuff, is Veerskamp, who mm. I mean, I thought he might get a game because I kind of couldn't figure out why you'd sign him if you wouldn't have intent yeah. to play him. He hasn't so far. I know Estelle and I know Jared Kimber both think he wasn't gonna get a game just because of the way uh, things are panning out. Hopefully he's impressing enough that he might get a game, you know, at some point, or if he doesn't enough that he gets picked up again next season. Yeah. Though, as we I mentioned, think, there is this mega auction going on, so who knows? I think it could happen because um, Mark Ande got quite a lot of tap today. Mm. I think he got hit for three or four sixes on the bounce. And uh, I don't think Aidan Markram is really setting the world on fire. Yeah, And so, you know, that could. I think that could be a shift that they might make. I'd love to see him get a game. It'd be oh, it'd be seismic. It would be seismic. Um, sh- I, I think we leave our IPL chat there, and now should we just pivot mm. again? I will say once more: if you do decide to partner with us, sponsor us, we can place your ad in here. Uh, you can pick whichever <laughs> one of us, or even Estelle, to voice it as well. Um, let Let's talk about the World Cup squad because I read today somewhere that I think the the squad has to be picked by is it the second of May? Yeah, the next Wednesday. Wednesday. Next Wednesday. Yeah, whatever day that is. Yeah, and on top of all that, there's this weird thing where they've picked a 32 man squad. Yeah, great idea. Except we know at least five of them aren't in the country because they're playing IPL. So I don't really understand what what they're doing. I suppose they're all getting together. Maybe maybe the Calipers might be back out. Maybe Mickey <laughs> Arthur left them. Chris Silverwood has found them. Who knows? Um, but we're, we're kind of in T20 World Cup uh, uh, preliminary stages. There was a 32-man squad that came out a couple of weeks ago. That's been trimmed. Seven players um, have been let go. So it's now 25. They were kind of the predictable seven. Uh, Avishka, Kuzpale, uh, Chandamal, Sahan, Jonathan Arnage, Laru Madashanka, and Kamara are, are the seven players who, hmm. who've, who've apparently not made it. There's been no, this is just what I'm learning from social media. Um, I haven't seen any official lists for this. So Barnica um, is still in there. Barnica is still in there. Nick, what are you thinking about that 25 man uh, squad? Oh, is Barnica going to make the cut? Well, yeah, Barnica was the guy who I uh, wanted to bring up because he's the real wild card, right? I mean, he's played next to no cricket all year. I think he had a couple of games in the SA20, and that's about it. Uh, but I still have him. I mean, I'm the eternal optimist. When I think of Barnica, I think of the Asia Cup Barnica, who um, just slugged sixes for fun. I, I still got him in Sri Lanka's best 11. Uh, I would like to see him in the 15-man squad, but I could kind of see uh, if they're looking at him as not a starter. I'd have him in because I'm at like number six um, in my team. But I could kind of see that if they think he's going to be a spare batter, the temptation might be to go for DDS over him because he just does more stuff, right? He's someone who can open. He's someone who can plug in in the middle order. He can bowl spin. So I think that's the kind of safe option. But I um, I really like the idea of Barnica being in this squad, being in this team. And I mean, I was going through what the 15 that I would pick um, or the, a kind of mix of what I think they'll pick with some of my selections. And I think the idea of having like potentially 
Hasaranga Banaka Shanaka Matthews as your five, six, seven, eight is quite exciting because it's a bit like an IPL team with an impact batter, although albeit a slightly lesser version of it. But I mean, <laughs> batting that deep gives you the uh, potential that you can, like, you've got eight guys who can go really hard and not worry too much about losing their wicket and um, just keep coming. So, I mean, and who, who, that, just to clarify, can you clarify who your top four would be then? Yeah, so I think the top four would be, I don't know, I think this is pretty locked in, right? That it'll be Patham, Kusal, Kamindu and Sharath Asalanka as top four. And then okay, I think yeah, yeah. Um, I would like to see Hasaranga, Barnaka. Um, I've got Matthews and Sharnaka. That's not what I want to see, but I just think that's like locked in at seven and eight. Oh, and who, then, who, do you, who do you want to see then? Well, I think I just think you've got to go with one of those guys, not both of them. And then... Um, probably bring in an extra bowler. Um, but I don't think they'll do that. I think they'll, they'll then have the bowlers 9, 10, 11 as Deeks, Paterana and one of Chimiro Madushanka. Mm. Yeah, I think, you know, what Nick's saying, so I think there are 13 basic locks if they're healthy. Yeah, I agree, Dom. Yeah, Kusal, Patham, Kamindu, Sadira, Charith, Angelo, Dawson, so that's seven batters. And then Patirana, Chimira, Madushanka, Dushara, Hasaranga, and Thikshana. So you need one more batter and probably one more spinner. Um, and I think the batter is between Bonica, KJP, and DDS, depending on what they want to do. Um, left-handedness might be helpful. So that that could advantage either one of Bonica or KJP. Um and then I think it's basically who is the backup spinner? Is it Akila, Vandersay, or Vyas Kanth? I mean, I think it's probably going to be one of Akila or Vandersay, but um, who knows? You don't think Weller's got a shot of getting in there? I think he's just too far down the list because they've already signaled they don't want to go to youth. They've already yeah. given Akila and Vandersay, you know, um, a lot of reps. So I think it'll be very hard to move off one of those two. And I think the only one who really has a chance is if Vyas Khan really does something special in a couple of games, I think they might, they might reconsider it, but even then not, not totally sure. I kind of can't believe a killer's going to, going to go to another World Cup. (laughs) To his like 14th World Cup. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, um, the I mean, only survivor from like... 1996, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we'd all like to see Vias Kanth, wouldn't we? Picked as the third spinner in the squad, um, but I agree with Dom. I think he'd have to at least play an IPL game and do well for that to even be a consideration. I... Yeah. What if What if Travis Head and uh, and Abhishek Sharma come out and say, you know, we just can't hit him in the nets. You know, he's he's too good. Klassen says I can't get him. I can't get him off the square. I mean, if they're saying that they're not playing him, then <laughs> that's, that's extraordinary. Uh, I mean, I do think that up this is... Australia if they're saying that in South Africa. Like... Yeah. Um, the selectors have kind of tied themselves into knots with this one, haven't they? Because there was yeah. the chance to pick him after he did really well in the ILT Twenty, and they came out saying we're backing experience. We don't want to blood new players this late to the World Cup. And then, I mean, yeah, now they're in a slightly awkward position, right? Yeah, it's only. I think it's only awkward if he ends up playing and, and getting wickets. I don't. Yeah, that's right. true. I mean, he has yeah. to actually do something to make it awkward. Yeah. Um, but I do think that if one of Hasaranga and Theeks went down injured, and I mean, we haven't heard anything about Hasaranga's like injury status, have we? Uh, I do think that Vierskant is kind of the guy who you'd want in there. Yeah. I think that's probably what they would do is have him as a traveling replacement. And then should he get injured, he's the guy, should one of those two get injured, I'm sure he's the guy who they'll put in uh, ahead of Vander Sayer or Killa. I I just think, and obviously I've been radicalized in my thoughts around this by by Jared Kimber did a video about it, but 15 people is just too... Too few, isn't it? You want it is to... way too few. I agree. I, when I was doing that squad today, and it was like you get one spare batter and yeah. it, um, and one spare yeah. bowler, yeah, yeah. Um, because I, I, I think in an ideal world, is you take uh, 
you take Vic, a killer on the, on, on the basis that he seems yeah. to be the the, the, the favourite at the moment. You take Veerskate, you take Rolalage, and you take uh, DDS, mm-hmm. right? So if you had two more, because Rolalage, I think, could be a he, he could be a finisher, could also bowl if you need him to bowl, um, and DDS is kind of a replacement for one of the top four. Um, and but would you also, guys like, Bonica if you were, I, I would pick Bonica if I had two other spots. I'd pick Bonica and KJP just because you know one of those guys. If they fire, they can give you a good innings every once in a while. Um, not a guarantee, but there are very few guys to me. DDS, I'm not. I, I've never seen him do what KJP or Bonica so, does. So, so I think though DDS benefits from the from the squad being so small, mm-hmm. right? Because you've got yeah, to take he players can cover like, bases, right? Cover yeah. bases, yeah. So you're like, I mean, even if I was KJP, I'd be, I'd walk out every to every practice session with my wicket keeping gloves on, just to remind the selectors, like I can do multiple jobs here, yeah. boss. But he's uh, the, he really the third wicket keeper because Sadira can also keep wicket. Yeah, though he can bat one through four. I think that's the other. Yeah, he can bat anywhere in the top four, yeah. and he's left-handed, so yeah. he's got a little, a couple of strings to his bow. Yeah. Um, it's 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 tough, and also like what's going on with with uh, Dilshan Madhushankar's injury, right? Yeah. Because that kind of changes what the eleven is, and changes yeah. I think changes a lot. Because I think there's um, some teams that want to play Madhushanka against, like I think against India, that they, they definitely feel like there's something about this left uh, left hand pace that they're weak to. Yeah. Yeah. Do you guys see it as like with um, if it's two seamers in the eleven? Do you think it's kind of horses for courses situation? I don't think they'll do that. They should do that, but I think they'll probably just stick with whatever two. Just stick with the two who they choose as first choice, yeah. which I yeah. guess would be probably Paterana and Chamira. Yeah. If I was going to take a punt on it at the moment. I'd like to see them play three seamers and kick off Sadira, basically. Uh, yeah, and would you stick with the Matthews and Sharnaka double axis on? Yeah, but not bowl them. Oh. <laughs> I, I think I think I think they're they're kind of handy to have, right? In case someone blows because, up, right? Yeah, yeah, and, and also, I mean, I mean, you say not bowl them. I mean, like Mumbai India's whole bowling strategy is based around the Angelo Matthews, like. Theorem, right? It's like <laughs> just kind of start with something that you're just not going to expect. I think you're, give, I think to you're giving too much then. credit to there being a theory behind whatever is going on with their opening of the bowling. <laughs> like, uh, well, for Mumbai Indians, maybe, yeah. but like, you know, Angel- there's a whole think tank behind Sri Lankan cricket and Angelo Matthews <laughs> opening <laughs> opening the bowling in 2024 with what, like 40 mile per hour. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> straight down the middle um, it, it, it was a fully fully thought out thing that has actually kind of weirdly weirdly works yeah it um, does weirdly work I agree with yeah, that yeah I'm, I'm vague I'm but, kind of vaguely into it until like someone like Phil Salt comes along and takes him for yeah like, exactly seven so, and over yeah, that, yeah that's but, the problem is that you like you you wonder when it's going to go bust you two sound like agenda wrongles. I can tell you exactly what's going to happen when, when they face England. Is Phil Salt's going to hit the first one for six. He's going to hit the second one for four. The third one, he's going to get caught out. After I can see it. it. Uh, yeah. Um, and then you're going to go, oh, look, England are 10 for one after the first over. <laughs> and when it, we know the thing about England is, is doubt creeps into their, their cricketing psyche very quickly. So 10 for one becomes 10 for two. 10 for two becomes 10 for, for three after two overs. And then it's all downhill for them after that. And and do you know who's who would be the man of the match in that situation? Angelo Matthews. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the eye for you two agenda uncles. Um, I, I said I'm into it just with reservations. With and reservations. I, I'm, I'm kind of I'm warm to Matthews taking the new ball. <laughs> um. Anyway, guys, should we leave it there? We'll obviously be back because I think the next time we record, I think the squad will actually be out. Yeah. And um, the the qualifiers will still be going on for the women. Though I think by that stage, I think this time next week, we should know if they're qualified. And um, the IPL will still going on. Maybe might have been, so we might have seen Shamir in action and we might see a little bit more for Think Shana. And if we're really, really, really lucky, Vizca would have got his first... Uh, uh, wicket by then. Uh, we've been the Murley End. If you got this far and you haven't subscribed to the newsletter, then what are you doing? Jump on it right now. It's on Substack, 
We'll be back next week. Thanks a lot. Bye.